Hello YouTube. Um, so I've been uh, a little bit inspired, actually, by Piro's videos on Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, kind of breaking it down into chunks and picking it apart and, uh, and playing with the text a little bit. Um, and so I thought I would do something similar, because uh, it's interesting, right? And so I've picked a text um, that's really hard. Um, I've picked a text that's really pregnant with interpretation, potential interpretation, and uh, has been read a thousand different ways by a thousand different interpreters uh, in the past 200 or so years. Less than 200 years. And the text that I picked is Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, and in this video, I'm just going to go through, I guess, the, f the first 11, first 12 paragraphs of the preface of, phenomenolo of the Phenomenology of the Spirit. This is how dense it is, right? I expect this might be something like a 20-minute video just talking about these first 12 or so paragraphs. Um, but I've bro blocked out some of the text to... Uh, to talk about, um, because I think it has a lot of, there's a lot of content that might be interesting to talk about, particularly on YouTube, um, because he, he talks about some things that I, that I think are applicable to the, the YouTube discourse, let's say. Um, now this is, again, a very, very difficult work. Um, particularly the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit is known as a standalone philosophical work that's extremely difficult in and of itself. Um, the text actually gets easier after the preface, and I read this in college, uh, and the teacher that I had um, had us read the, the book before reading the preface, um, so it might, so that the preface was comprehensible. Um, which might be the better strategy, but I'm going to try and start the preface um, and go through it bit by bit. Um, the text, or the, the, the translation that I have, has all the paragraphs numbered, which is really helpful. Um, so if you want to read along, I should be able to give proper citations uh, for, for each of the 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 passages that I read and, and talk about. Um, let's start with the title, though, right? The Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, first of all, spirit. What is spirit for Hegel? Um, I'm not going to try and answer that question here. Um, instead, that's something that I'd, I'd like to unpack as as the text kind of unfolds. Um, so in some way that's kind of a guiding question for the reading of the text. What is spirit for Hegel? Um, but I will say this, um, the, in the German uh, it's the word Geist, which can be translated as spirit, it can be translated as ghost, and it can be translated as mind. Um, and I think all of that, uh, if you consider the sort of multidimensional aspect of the word, that might help in understanding precisely what Hegel means by spirit. Um, the word obviously in English has religious connotations, um, which is of course another really interesting subject when it comes to Hegel. Hegel was studying to be a priest for a long time. Um, so we're, we're left with this question, right, of, of is Hegel a religious person? And it's extremely difficult to answer that question. Sometimes it looks like he's a devout Christian, which is a more conservative reading of Hegel. Sometimes it does not. Um, uh, some people read Hegel as an atheist. Um, so that's another uh, sort of guiding question. What's 
what is Hegel's relationship to religion, and in particular Christianity. Um, because if he is... If Hegel is an atheist, then he's, then he's definitely an extremely Christian atheist. Um, uh, now, the other part of the title, The Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, when Hegel uses the word phenomenology, um, when we use it nowadays, we tend to think of it in terms of Husserl, who is a, a later German philosopher. Um, who really uh, distilled that term. In Hegel's day, that term was less um, defined. Um, and I think uh, the easiest way to understand what Hegel means by phenomenology is in reference to Kant. Um, and so for Kant, there were two sort of layers to reality. There was the noumenal, which is things in themselves, and there was the phenomenal, which is ha things as we experience them, right? So uh, this this pen, you know, if my mind is active and does things, right, if it constructs an image of the world, then what is this pen in the absence of mind, right? For Kant, you can't answer that question. So he calls this aspect of the pen the noumenal, or the thing in itself, sometimes you'll get. Um, and he calls the pen as it appears to me um, the phenomenon of the pen, right? So phenomenon is linked to appearance rather than essence, right? So the phenomenology of spirit, it's something like either spirit as it appears or that which appears to spirit, right? Um, and I think both are kind of true about the text. Um, I think you can read it either way, and I think for Hegel those are kind of identical statements. Um, but in some way we could take that as, another, as a third guiding question. Precisely, what is the phenomenology of the spirit? What is appearing to what? And and what is the mechanism uh, by which the thing appears? Um, that's, in some way, that, that definitely is the crux of the work. Um, so let's get into the preface, right? The preface is on scientific cognition, right? That's the, the title of the preface. Now, we should be clear that Hegel doesn't use the word science in the way that we think of the word science. Right. And I think that this is true uh, in German in general. Maybe if, uh, if Socrates is watching this, I don't know if he watches my videos anymore, but if Socrates is watching this, uh, he might be able to clarify better than I can. But as far as I understand it, the word science in German has a much broader context than, um, than it does in English, right? So he's not talking about empiricism, right? Uh, he's not talking about empirical sort of verification. He's not talking about data. Um, what he is talking about, um, well, let's go to the text, right? He says here, so this is just to talk about the question, what is science? What does Hegel mean by science? On the one hand, this is a quote, on the one hand, in the ordinary view of anatomy, for instance, say, the knowledge of the parts of the body regarded as inanimate. We are quite sure that we do not as yet possess the subject matter itself, the content of this science. 
but must in addition exert ourselves to know the particulars. Further, in the case of such an aggregate of information, which has no right to bear the name science, an opening talk about aim in such generalities is usually conducted in the same historical and uncomprehended way in which the content itself, these m nerves, muscles, etc., is spoken of. Okay, so for anatomy, anatomy doesn't count as science for Hegel, right? Because it's particulars regarded as inanimate. Um, so we might think of this in our modern parlance, the way I read this at least. We might think of this in our modern parlance as saying something like, if you have data, it's not yet science without a theory to interpret that data. Right. Um, so for Hegel, science is the systematizing of thought. So if we have a description of a lung, for instance, that's not science. But when you put the lung into the system of the body and describe how uh, describe how oxygen is carried within the system of the body to make the whole work. That is, <clears throat> the particular being the lung and the whole being the body. Science is about the whole and its relation to particulars, right? This is what Hegel means by scientific thought. Um, he's not talking about empiricism. He's talking about systematization, right? Uh, that should be noted. And I think in German, again, the, the word that Hegel uses has more this connotation than the modern English word science uh, in terms of testing things empirically and such like that. Um, so Hegel is very interested in the relationship between wholes and particulars. That much we can tell right off the bat. Um, but first of all, I'm, I'm going to talk about the following uh, part of paragraph two. Because I think this is important, right? Quote, the more conventional opinion gets fixated on the antithesis of truth and falsity, the more it tends to expect a given philosophical system to be either accepted or rejected, and hence it only finds acceptance or rejection. It does not comprehend the diversity of philosophical systems as the progressive unfolding of truth but rather sees in its simple disagreements. The bud disappears in the bursting forth of the blossom, and one might say that the former is refuted by the latter. Similarly, when the fruit appears, the blossom is shown up in its turn as a false manifestation of the plant, and the fruit now emerges as the truth of it instead. Yet at the same time, their fluid nature makes them moments of an organic unity in which they not only do not conflict, but in which each is as necessary as the other. And this mutual necessity alone constitutes the life of the whole. This is going to tell, this one passage is the best way into Hegel, right? Into understanding what Hegel's trying to do and an understanding um, uh, his method, right? So the point isn't to say, you know, for Hegel, if we talk about free will and determinism, the goal isn't to take a stance and then provide a proof of free will or determinism. The goal is rather to understand uh, the conditions that give rise to free will, and well, let's just take free will out of the two of them. The conditions that give rise to free will, 
the reasons why we might want to assert uh, the existence of free will, what that does for us in the long run, uh, and the same for determinism. And the key is to understand the struggle between the two rather than to prove one over the other, right? So to look at free will and determinism as part of a whole, even though they're mutually exclusive. That's Hegel's primary motivation here. That's his... He's going to be doing that a lot. So in some way, in some way, I've heard it said before that everything is true for Hegel in so far as it's a moment of thought, right? Um, so yeah, that paragraph is, is really good for finding the way into Hegel, and he provides it in paragraph two of the Phenomenology of Spirit. So that's good. It's good. Clear so far, which is not Hegel's style usually. Um, He also talks a, a, a little bit about method, right? And this is where I think uh, it becomes applicable to to uh, YouTube and the discourse on YouTube. This is what's important, and and I'll mention something um, after after I read these two. Well, I'm going to read two sentences from paragraph three. He talks about aim and results, and stating the aim and results in, in the preface, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the preface of a work, the, pre the, the preface of a work. He says, he critiques that attitude, and he says, this concern with aim or results, with differentiating and passing judgment on various thinkers, is therefore an easier task than it might seem. For instead of getting involved in the real issue, this kind of activity is always a way beyond it. Instead of tarrying with it and losing itself in it, this kind of knowing is forever grasping at something new. It remains essentially preoccupied with itself instead of becoming preoccupied with the real issue and surrendering to it. Mm -hmm. To judge a thing that has substance and solid worth is quite easy. To comprehend it is much harder and to blend judgment and comprehension in a definitive description is the hardest thing at all. So, the point is, and this is a, this is a, uh, I think a sentiment, this is the reason why I'm, um, I think this is applicable to the YouTube idea. I think this is a sentiment that we could all learn from, right? In that, it's easy to look at, say, something and say, oh, that's bullshit. Uh, it's much more difficult to really get into the nitty-gritty of the thing and to try and understand the thing and to try and get something out of it, even if your first uh, evaluation of it is, oh, that's bullshit. Um, so Adorno has a line, and Adorno is, is very much a Hegelian. Adorno has a line, and he's actually talking about Hegel, where he says something like, um, the goal of reading Hegel, specifically, is not to ask the question, what do we think about Hegel, right? The goal is to ask the question, what would Hegel think about us? That is to say, to use the system as Hegel laid out, to, un to uncover and understand aspects of problems that we might not have considered before. So, when you, in some sense, I would, I would provide this as the statement for, for the YouTube discourse. When one, uh, when you see something that sounds ridiculous or absurd or something like that, it's very easy to just condemn it. On the other hand, it's a very, it's a much more noble, I think, gesture to try and inhabit it and to try and understand yourself and your positions from that lens. Um, and to really, really be able to get into the nitty-gritty of it, if only as an exercise in debate, right? Uh, to be able to inhabit it and debate the other side of the position, 
even better than they can, right? Um, you should never learn about some opposing viewpoint. You should never stop learning about some opposing viewpoint until you change your beliefs in one way or another. Um, not to say that you're convinced by it, but that by even arguing with it, your beliefs can be shaken. I think this is Hegel's real point here. Um, that's sort of the the true task of what he's getting at. Um, so in this text, he's going to talk a lot about a lot of different philosophical systems. But the point isn't to merely just critique them. It's to understand them from within. So yeah, that's a much heavier undertaking. Um, Okay, this is, I'm going to talk about the beginning of paragraph 7 for just a moment. Um, the only reason why I'm going to talk, I'm going to read this passage is it's because it's the first place that he uses the word spirit. Um, and I want to kind of try and get at, over time, what he means by the word spirit. If we apprehend a demand of this kind in its broader context and view it as it appears at the stage which self-conscious spirit has presently reached, it is clear that spirit has now got behind this, beyond the substantial life it formerly led in the immediacy of thought, that it is behind the immediacy of faith, beyond satisfaction and security of the certainty that consciousness then had of its reconciliation with the essential being, and of that being's universal presence within and without. Two things there. He talks about spirit. This is the stage that spirit reach, re, has reached, right? Um, and it doesn't matter what he's talking about before that. I, I think he's really trying to get at Schelling and the Romantics. Um, and he's saying, this is where we're at, right? Um, and he's pointing out to that it's not, quote, reconciled with the essential being and of that being's universal presence, pre excuse me, presence, both within and without. This uh, strikes me as a reference to God. Um, it's reconciliation with the essential being. It's a slick reference to God. But, notice something important here, or I notice something important here, and it's something that I think I want to carry through as a theme as I read. If that's a reference to God, the essential being, uh, it, he doesn't refer to it as a subject. It's not his essential being. Right? It's not, it's not a person here. It's just the essential being. So that's, that's, just wanted to read that to show how Hegel uses the word spirit. How he talks about, this is another thing when we talked about the bud and the flower and the fruit, right? Stages of spirit unfolding in time. And this is where, what, this is where we are at. Right? So there's some relationship between us and spirit. Um, in some sense, for Hegel, I think it's clear that in one way or another, we are spirit. Um, but precisely what that means uh, is up in the air. Um, it talks about the eye of spirit talks about the spirit showing itself to be impoverished like a wanderer in the desert, craving for a mere mouthful of water. By the little which now satisfies spirit, we can measure the extent of its loss. So spirit is not something that's omnipotent. It's something that, um, that can be impoverished and can experience loss. Um, so spirit is not identical to 
to any traditional notion of God. We should, we should make that distinction between spirit and God, first of all. Um, he also talks about God here. Moreover, when this non-conceptual, substantial knowledge professes to have sunk the idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic, idiosynchronicity of the self in essential being, and to philosophize in a true and holy manner, it hides the truth from itself. By spurning measure and definition, instead of being devoted to God, it merely gives free rein to both the contingency of the content within it and to its own caprice. Such minds, when they give themselves up to the uncontrolled ferment of the divine substance, imagine that by drawing a veil over self-consciousness and surrendering understanding, they become the beloved of God to whom he gives wisdom in it sleep. And hence what they do in fact receive, hence what they in fact receive and bring to birth in their sleep is nothing but dreams. So, um, he talks about holiness, he talks about God, but he talks about other people that he's criticizing being devoted to God in a particular way. He's talking about people giving up rationality. Um, now, I'm still not sure that's God. And the video is getting really long. The video is getting really long, so I'm not necessarily going to put into context why. Um, in some sense, I'll say this. Uh, is, is God, who he's referring to, God as concept? Right? The concept of God. The idea of God. Or is it some actual ontological being? That's the question that's up in the air in this paragraph. And I think it's really difficult to answer that question from the text itself. So we're going to soldier on. There's one more uh, passage that I want to read, and it's the end of paragraph 11. Yeah. Into paragraph 12. I'm going to read the end of paragraph 11 into paragraph 12. Spirit is indeed never at rest, but always engaged in moving forward. This is important. Spirit is teleological. It moves forward. There's an idea of progress in Hegel. That's essential. Spirit is indeed never at rest, but always engaged in moving forward. But just as the first breath drawn by a child after its long, quiet nourishment breaks the gradualness of merely quantitative growth, growth, not growth, uh, there is a qualitative leap, and the child is born. So likewise, the spirit in its formation matures slowly and quietly into its new shape, dissolving bit by bit the structure of its previous world whose tottering state is only hinted at by isolated, isolated symptoms. The frivolity and boredom which unsettle the established order, the vague foreboding of something unknown, these are the heralds of approaching change, the gradual crumbling that left unaltered the face of the whole is cut short by a sunburst, which in one flash illuminates the features of the new world. So this is important. This is how th that's the end of chapter eleven and or the end of paragraph eleven. And I'm going to read the beginning of chapter twelve, but I want to break. This is important um, because Hegel here is talking about how the world progresses and the old structures in progress slowly dissolve, and then we sort of look around and all of a sudden we're in a new world we realize kind of all at once. There, there's a flash and we're in a new world. But it's been happening over time, slowly, right? In some way, I've heard before, uh, you know, the metaphor, how does a dam break, right? It cracks piece by piece over time for generations. But when it comes down, it looks like it happens all in a flash. So this is how progress happens for Hegel. 
This is how the destruction of the old world happens for Hegel. Bit by bit, things crumble, lose their fixedness. Things lose their meaning. We perceive ourselves as, leaving it, as, as living in a meaningless world without coordinates. Uh, and then in a flash, we realize that we're in a new paradigm. Um, this you can look at as being in parallel with uh, you can look at it as in parallel to um, on the structure of scientific revolutions. It's a famous book. Uh, I believe it's Kuhn. Yes, it's definitely Kuhn. Um, please uh, look that up. It's it's very similar in how he outlines progress. Uh, though I think Kuhn was extremely anti-Hegelian. And uh, there are plenty of figures after this, but Hegel, as far as I'm aware, is one of the first people to think of history as an emergent whole. Right. And it happens in, it's similar to punctuated evolution, right? Uh, not a lot of change, not a lot of change, and then radical change due to some environmental shift, and then not a lot of change, right? Like, that's how, that's how Hegel imagines the de the shape of the development of the shapes of spirit. Again, what spirit is is up for contention, but it's somehow us. It's related to us and how we cognize the world. Beginning of chapter twelve. But this new world is no more complete actuality than is a newborn child. It is essential to bear this in mind. It comes on the scene for the first time in its immediacy or its notion. Just as little as the building is finished when its foundation has been laid, so little is the achieved notion of the whole itself. When we wish to see an oak with its massive trunk and spreading branches and foliage, we are not content to be shown an acorn instead. So too science, the crown of a world of spirit, is not complete in its beginnings. The onset of the new spirit is the product of a widespread upheaval in various forms of culture, the prize at the end of a complicated, torturous path, and of just as variegated and strenuous an effort. It is the whole which, having traversed in its content, in time and space, has returned into itself, and is the resultant simple notion of the whole. But the actuality of this simple whole consists in those various shapes and forms which have become its moments, and which will now develop and take shape afresh, this time in their new element, in their newly acquired meaning. So this is also really uh, essential. So one, the easiest historical parallel that I can think of to point to is uh, the Russian Revolution. Um, Tsarism was crumbling for, for years and years, before the October Revolution, but when it happened, it happened in a flash, right? When communism, when Lenin took over, it happened very quickly. Um, but the seeds of that revolution were present for a very long time and were developing for a very long time. Now, when Lenin took over, um, that society that was established right away was not the Soviet Union. It's not how we think of the Soviet Union. It was just the very beginnings of the thing. But something happened. Something radically radical happened. Um, and, and that's the kind of... This is an anachronistic example, because Hegel was writing well before. But um, that kind of example is, is what Hegel is thinking about. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is a good place to to stop it. Um, so the other thing, too, that, to point out from that last passage is that when he's talking about changes in spirit, he's already referenced two different uh, things, right? Changes in spirit are like the shapes of spirit that he talks about, the, uh, the forms of spirit are, at the same time, different philosophies that are antagonistic to one another in the particular. But when you look at it as the whole, they appear mutually necessary, right? 
Now, when the whole changes, the world changes, right? So this for Hegel, the stakes here are political, um, the stakes are scientific. Um, he's trying to give an account of everything, right? So this is why spirit is left as sort of an indeterminate idea, uh, I think, because he's trying to provide something that can be applied, or he's trying to provide a model that can be applied to anything. Um, spirit is going to be the point of view. Spirit is going to be the protagonist of this story that he's going to tell in the phenomenology of the spirit. Um, and in some way that might be a way to think, to think through this book. This is jumping ahead a little bit. But this is a way to think through this book. He's going to be telling the story and of spirit, of the history of everything, kind of. But precisely what that means we'll get into a bit later. So yeah, um, comment. Uh, I hope to do more of these videos. If people are bored and don't watch them, then I won't, unless people want me to. But this is kind of just a dry run. Uh, if you want to le read along, that's just the first 12 paragraphs of the preface of the Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, if you have any questions or are confused by anything, also please comment. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, and have a good night.